Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of Dearborn, Then and Now. I'm Helen Mumalakis, archivist with the Dearborn Historical Museum, and your host for these special programs regarding the wonderful history of our hometown, Dearborn, Michigan. Today, our topic is that very special place that so many of us Dearbornites have visited frequently, especially in the summertime. Camp Dearborn has come to mean sandy beaches, sunbathing, picnicking, and all sorts of summer fun to a multitude of Dearborn citizens. It is, in essence, our very own country club, the Citizens Country Club. And today, we will get an insider's view of what it was like to have spent time there, camping, working there, and yes, even walking there. <music> It is believed that the inspiration for a city-owned recreational facility outside the boundaries of Dearborn originated from a casual bonfire discussion in which Orville Hubbard, then a candidate for the office of mayor, spoke with Boy Scout troop leaders Paul E. Johnston, Stanley P. O'Neill, and Hans E. Frieden about the viability of a municipal camp for the city of Dearborn. This discussion took place in 1940 on Lake Skinner near Lapeer, Michigan. Hubbard had participated in this Boy Scout camp with his son, Jim. He had promised to look into the matter of a municipal camp or campsite park if he were to be elected to the office of mayor for the city of Dearborn. When Hubbard was elected, however, there were more pressing issues at hand. World War II had broken out and Hubbard joined the rest of the nation in supporting our troops and ensuring that our city was ready for any potential attack. Camp Dearborn was, understandably, put on the back burner for a little while. When the war ended and the soldiers returned to everyday life, the need for more than just jobs for our returning GIs was apparent. It was during this time that Mayor Hubbard made good on his promise to pursue a municipal camp and picnic area for the citizens of Dearborn. After all, Hubbard, an ex-Marine himself, understood the needs of our returning war heroes. Indeed, the mayor's office was constantly reminded of Dearborn's growing population as City Hall remained very busy with assisting to find housing for the GIs and, of course, with the mayor himself performing a good deal of weddings in the mid-1940s. It was Hubbard's belief that the government has an important role to play in providing social services for its citizens. It was this belief that drove Hubbard to work up a proposal for a commission to look into the prospect of establishing a city-owned campgrounds for its citizenry. His first proposal to establish a camp commission in 1946 was knocked down by the city council. Hubbard was nothing if not committed and firm in his personal beliefs, and it is a befitting kudo to him that the establishment of a Dearborn Camp Commission was passed, though narrowly, in the City Council a year later in 1947. There were originally 27 people of diverse backgrounds on the original Dearborn Camp Commission. That number would grow to 45. The Commission's primary responsibility at the outset of this venture was to find a place that was a suitable location with plenty of acreage and lakes that could become beaches or small water sport areas. After reviewing several different sites, the Commission settled on a 200-acre-plus farm site in Milford, Michigan. The area satisfied all of the requirements of the Commission, there were lakes with sandy bottoms so that beaches could be established. The water was tested and found to have acceptable low levels of bacteria. And there was plenty of acreage with trees and natural woods. This was everything that the commission and the mayor had hoped for. It would be the perfect camping and recreational area for the citizens of Dearborn. The final sale transaction was made in December of 1947. The city of Dearborn immediately embarked on its mission to make Camp Dearborn notable and successful. 
During the winter of 1948, an estimated $10,000 was spent by the city to do the initial road making, to buy necessary supplies such as picnic tables and grills, and to do well digging and create such necessities as bathhouses and toilet areas. All this was done to ensure that all of the citizens of Dearborn would enjoy their very own city park with beaches, campsites, and picnic areas. A newspaper article appearing in the Dearborn Independent front page on April 30, 1948, announced that the preliminary plans were being made to hold an open house at the newly acquired Dearborn Municipal Campsite near Milford, Michigan. It was to be held on Memorial Weekend, May 29th, 30th, and 31st. A mad flurry of activity occurred just before the official Memorial Day opening of Camp Dearborn in 1948. The public restrooms were completed just days before the park opened. Trash cans were delivered just days away from the opening. Though the city had bought picnic tables, more tables had to be borrowed from the huron Clinton Metropolitan Authority just for the opening. It was also during this wild race to the finish line, so to speak, that the camp got its official name of Camp Dearborn. While the physical work was being done at a mad pace at the actual site, the advertising of the new Citizens Country Club was being widely publicized. Long newspaper articles appeared in Dearborn's local newspapers outlining the opening weekend festivities. Maps of camp were reprinted in the newspapers. Dearbornites with cars were encouraged to bring their neighbors who did not have transportation to this new place, this recreational dream of a lifetime, to this new Citizens Country Club. All of the publicity and hard work paid off as an estimated 2,500 people came to Camp Dearborn on its Memorial Day opening in 1948. At the time, there was still massive construction going on around the camp. Roads were still being dug out. All of the grills and picnic tables had not arrived, and yet that didn't seem to discourage the citizens of Dearborn. As a matter of fact, nothing seemed to slow the flow of Dearbornites that flocked to Camp Dearborn in the summer of 1948. After an extremely successful launching of Camp Dearborn, its popularity grew. There were an estimated 7,000 visitors to Dearborn's newest Park Beach facility over the 4th of July weekend in 1948. The Dearborn City Council granted special funds to be made immediately to the camp for the purchase of boats, picnic tables, benches, trash cans, and two Ford tractors. This was an emergency measure granted by the council to the city purchasing agent to buy this equipment in order to accommodate the crowds which were flocking to the camp with substantial increased regularity. While we know the history of Camp Dearborn, while we can document the day that the mortgage agreement was signed, the day that the first car drove into camp, what we have to offer in this program is something very special indeed. We have an insider's view of what it was like to actually camp, work, and yes, even walk to Camp Dearborn. And this isn't just any insider's view. This is the view of our very own mayor, John B. O'Reilly, Jr. I was very fortunate that the mayor found time in his extremely busy schedule for an interview regarding Camp Dearborn. Hi, I'm here with a very special guest to offer us some insight into Camp Dearborn. We've learned about Camp Dearborn's past, and now we learn about the true past, Mayor. We're here to talk about what really happened at Camp Dearborn. So, Mayor, what are your first remembrances of Camp Dearborn? Camp and I are the same age, and I've been out there all my life. I, my parents tell me, I don't remember, the early first early visits, but they tell me you know, we were out there, uh, my Uncle Jim had this big tent and he would put it up right when camp opened and then 
each of our families would rotate through it. So it'd be up there for about eight weeks or so, seven, eight weeks, and then each of the families would take turns using the tent through the summer season. So then you did stay at Camp Dearborn overnight? Oh my gosh, yeah, from the very beginning. I mean, even beginning. before they built the tents and stuff, back when it opened. Yeah. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So now I hear that you were employed at Camp Dearborn as well. Yes. When I graduated from high school, I applied and got a job as a camp counselor there. So I did two summers there under B. Ryan, and B. Ryan was uh, amazing, but she was the matriarch of the camp and ran it with a very firm hand. <laughs> and then after two years there, I went down and worked in the regular camp, actually in Tent Village 1, as a green shirt, which was a, a status job. We can go in. So now what were your responsibilities? Well, it, it, of course, as a camp counselor, my responsibilities was to shepherd these young persons. Then as a green shirt, that was the thing. There were all these uh, different layers of employee classifications at camp, mm -hmm. and a green shirt was kind of the higher end. Lifeguards, of course, had their own status and an image under themselves. But uh, so the lifeguards are out there playing football on the beach all the time. It was a real cake job. But the, the green shirts had a pretty good deal. Uh, we went around Tent Village and serviced the Tent Village campers, you know, mm -hmm. and everybody who's staying in TV1, our job was to take care of them in every possible way. And we made sure that they took care of us in every possible way too. So it was a really good deal. This is what we all want to know, okay? Now, what were some of your experiences for fun as a teenager at camp? Well, of course the teen dances, because that was why you went out there. I mean, Sunday you were nobody if you weren't at the beach during the day and at the dance at night. That was, you know, just, uh, what, you uh, did. just what everybody did. I mean, that beach had no sand showing. Everybody had put their <laughs> blankets and things on. It was just, there was no sand showing. And um, I can, the statute of limitations have passed, so I can, confess. <laughs> we used to do things like, there were trampolines down on the beach. A bunch of trampolines you paid to go in. And of course at night we'd go and sneak on them. But you had to have everything covered because they, they were always patrolling, you know. Oh. And we were doing real good and then Mickey Brabant who always went out, we, you know, certain families and friends would always go out together. So we would always tell everybody, put all your stuff, your shoes, everything under the trampoline so we can dive under them and hide there oh. when the cars came by. <laughs> but he left his shoes out so they came down. Somebody must have reported that they saw kids on the trampolines. So, you know, we come down and they're, they're hunting us up and they saw the shoes and so we got caught that time. But, uh, but generally we did pretty well. And of course at night you'd, you'd hang around, you'd go to the campfires and then you'd kind of try and meet other people and you'd go to the TVs. And of course the, at camp in the early days, they had color TV before we had it at home, so that oh. was really cool. But uh, you'd have a row of four TVs with benches in front of them. Mm -hmm. And the first one would be channel 2, the second one would be channel 4, the next one would be channel 7, and the last one would be channel 9 from uh, Canada. Mm -hmm. And that was basically your, your viewing selection. So at night, they're all turned on, and so you could go and see who's hanging around. I mean, it wasn't so much you went to watch TV, mm -hmm. you went to see who was watching well, TV. Well, sure, yeah. So. Last thing I want to ask you about, Mayor, because I know you're in a very tight schedule and we're so pleased that you could join us today, is I understand that you walked to Camp Dearborn? Yeah, that was uh, an interesting thing. As I told you, Sundays were real important. So uh, one of our friends, Joe, his car had broken down again and we were always teasing him about his car. And so he was trying to hook up a ride to camp the next day. Well, you know how guys will tease and stuff. So we're going, hey, nobody, nobody's going to take Joe. You know, Joe, no, I'm not going to take any Joe and stuff. <laughs> Well, Joe was a proud guy, so he says, heck with all of you, I'm walking to camp. And we're going, uh, you know, no, I'm serious, I'm walking to camp. Well, we tried to kind of, you know, get him out of that path, but it became clear that Joe had made up his mind he was walking to camp. Well, then it was, well, if you're walking to camp, we're walking to camp. Very impromptu and spontaneously, we decided we were going to leave from St. Alphonsus, where I went. We were going to leave about 9 o'clock and walk all night to camp, because it was August. So I went home and told my father I'm walking to camp tonight. And my dad, is, you know, as he was great about, well, okay, that's an interesting experience, you know. Uh, but he, he was pleased to be, he says, let me write you a, a letter saying this is a class project or whatever, so if you run into any police, they have some legitimacy. So we set out, and it was just it was a great adventure. In fact, 
we walked up Schaefer to Grand River and then Grand River all the way out to, to New Hudson and then down uh, Milford Road and so on. So the police in Novi did stop us, as oh. it turned out. I mean, we're going through their quiet streets <clears throat> and they went, what are you doing here? And we pulled out the letter and they said, okay, and they escorted us through Novi. Oh. They literally oh. followed us all the, the way to the city line. And, uh, and then, of course, by the time we got uh, you know, three, four in the morning, fog, you couldn't see anything in front of you. But there was also no traffic. I mean, I remember we were walking down the middle of the street for a long time on Grand River and didn't have to move. I mean, it was, uh, it was quite a thing. So anyway, we got there and, uh, of course, we slept on the beach the whole day and none of us could dance that night no. because our uh, feet were not in shape. But it became a thing, I think, for the next 14 years after that, the school, I, I did it another time. I did it the next year also. And then from then on, it became a tradition for at least, I think, about 15 years where every class would go and walk to camp. Wow. Well, Mayor, I have to say that you truly are a Camp Dearborn <laughs> uh, fountain of knowledge. Oh. And we, re we have now reviewed how Camp Dearborn came to be, of course, in our well, previous discussion. Yeah. And um, I want to thank you very much. The one thing I wanted to leave um, our viewers with is um, what do you see as the most significant addition to the camp within like the last decade? In the last two years the camp uh, was able to generate enough revenue to pay its total operating costs and that's real landmark because yeah. it says you know okay then then it begins to move towards self-sustaining which then you know gives it more of an insulation from being something that's targeted for cuts. I want to thank you very much for your insight, and I think everyone's learned a little something today. Thank you, Thanks, Mayor, Helen. very much for being here today. Apparently, there was a lot more fun going on at Camp Dearborn than just swimming and the canteen dances. Thank you, Mayor O'Reilly, for an insider's view of a great place where, if you were so inclined, you could walk to in a scant 9 to 12 hours from Dearborn's East End. As Dearborn continues to grow, so does our attachment and affection for 